This training video is designed to assist resident engineers and inspectors assigned to administer and inspect irrigation systems for highway planting. This video will cover irrigation design, backflow preventers, PVC pipe and fittings, pressure testing PVC pipe, low voltage conductors, remote control valves, sprinklers, irrigation crossovers, testing of conductors, and the irrigation functional test. Information on irrigation is found in the standard specifications, standard special provisions, and project plans. These documents should be reviewed in detail during your inspections of the irrigation system. Irrigation plans are drawn schematically. That means that even though pipe, valves, and other facilities may be drawn in the roadway or outside of the right-of-way, they should be located in the planting areas. An irrigation system must have a water source. The source may be from a local water district providing domestic potable water or reclaimed water from a water treatment facility. The water meter is shown by this square with an X in it. The first component downstream from the water meter in a domestic potable system is the backflow preventer. The purpose of the backflow preventer is to protect the domestic water system from contamination. It prevents water within the irrigation system from siphoning back into the domestic water supply. All irrigation systems are required to have backflow prevention. The backflow preventer is shown by this rectangle with a diagonal line. The main supply line is installed downstream from the water meter and the backflow preventer. It carries water under pressure to quick coupling valves and the remote control valves. It is the main artery of the system. The master remote control valve is located downstream from the backflow preventer. Its purpose is to control the flow of water to the main supply lines so that they are not under constant pressure when irrigation is not taking place. It is activated when any remote control valve is activated. The master remote control valve is shown by the square. Remote control valves control the flow of water to the lateral supply lines and sprinklers. They are designed to be in a closed position when not operating. The remote control valves are also shown by squares and are usually grouped as shown here for the ease of maintenance. The remote control valve code shown in this bubble indicates the valve size, the irrigation controller, the controller station, and the rate that water flows through the valve. A quick coupling valve allows a hose to be connected for use by maintenance personnel. A manually operated gate valve or ball valve shuts water off to allow repairs to or replacement of the remote control valves. The lateral supply line is the pipe carrying water between the remote control valves and the sprinklers. The difference between the lateral and main supply lines is that the lateral supply lines are only under pressure when the remote control valve is open, whereas the main supply line is under pressure constantly when the master remote control valve is activated. Sprinklers are installed on the lateral supply line. In this plan, the sprinklers are shown by these symbols. The inspector should be aware that the valves and pipe of an irrigation system are designed to accommodate a certain flow at a certain pressure. If sprinklers are added or the sprinkler nozzle size is increased, coverage of each individual sprinkler will be reduced. If the sprinklers have small orifices, such as with drip or mini spray sprinklers, a filter assembly unit is installed to remove particles that might clog those orifices. Irrigation crossovers are installed where water supply lines or conductors cross the freeway. Irrigation crossovers are normally installed with the roadway project. The controller is the brain of an automatic irrigation system. Its purpose is to activate the system's electric remote control valves. Controllers are placed inside a heavy-duty metal enclosure. The enclosure is bolted to a concrete pad. 
Valves are connected to the controller with low voltage conductors shown by these lines. The conductors are usually placed in the same trench as is the main supply line. To operate most controllers, it is necessary to provide a 110 volt electrical power source. Traditionally, this is supplied by the local utility companies. Battery or solar powered controllers are options where there is no power source. We will now cover the components in detail. The backflow preventer assembly consists of a backflow preventer and other components. The backflow preventer is the part of the assembly that prevents contaminated water in the irrigation system from siphoning back into the domestic water supply. Caltrans standard specifications require that it be a reduced pressure backflow preventer. A pressure relief valve protects the irrigation system from high pressure spikes that can damage the supply line and backflow preventer. Its purpose is to open and allow excess pressure to dissipate to a safe level before closing. A gate valve or ball valve is installed on each side of the backflow preventer to shut down the water source for emergency situations or to remove the backflow preventer for replacement. For disassembly purposes, the gate or ball valves must be installed with flanges or unions at the proper locations on both sides of the backflow preventer. Pipe and fittings connecting the backflow preventer to the water meter must be galvanized steel. The connecting pipe will normally be installed at the same depth as the meter connection, but no less than 18 inches deep. Dielectric couplings must be installed where two dissimilar metals, such as galvanized steel and brass, are joined. The underground portion of the assembly's downstream leg will also be galvanized steel for at least three feet, where it will then be converted to the PVC main supply line. Concrete thrust blocks must be installed at the bottom of each assembly leg for stability. A Y strainer is located on the upstream side of the backflow preventer to remove particles from the water that may damage or clog valves or sprinklers. It must be modified so no attachments can be made to it. The concrete pad is to protect the soil from being eroded away when flushing the Y strainer or when the pressure relief valve activates. Be sure the outlets of these devices are directed toward the pad. Some projects include a protective cage as part of the installation. It's bolted to the concrete pad and hinged to fold away from the backflow preventer assembly for servicing. To prevent the system from being shut down by vandals, the valve handles can be chained and padlocked or removed in the open position. This is done when a protective cage is not used. Test cocks are small valves that testing equipment can be attached to. Testing must be done by a licensed backflow preventer inspector. Most projects will require an initial test and annual testing thereafter. A written test report is to be furnished by the tester that becomes part of the job file records. Rigid PVC pipe and fittings are the most common material used for irrigation systems. They must be buried. If used above grade, the sun's ultraviolet rays will make the pipe brittle. A rigid ultraviolet resistant PVC pipe is manufactured for on-grade installations. This type of pipe is used when the irrigation system cannot be buried due to rocky conditions. It is used also when the system is only to be used for a short period of time. Flexible PVC and polyethylene pipe are used for low pressure distribution systems such as drip emitters. Galvanized steel pipe is used where strength is needed or where a supply line is exposed to possible damage in a permanent system. The classification of PVC pipe may cause some confusion. PVC pipe always has a code such as PVC 1120. Then it will either have a class such as class 200 or a schedule usually 40 or 80. The code is made up of four elements, material type, type of compound, grade of compound, 
and the design stress of the material. Therefore, PVC 1120 is translated to PVC material type 1 compound, grade 1 compound, and a design stress of 2,000 pounds. The design stress should not be confused with the working pressure. It refers to the material strength only. Class is the recommended maximum working pressure of the pipe, while schedule refers to the wall thickness of the pipe. In small diameter pipes, schedule 40 and 80 size pipes are usually thicker than class size pipes. On Caltrans projects, main supply line and lateral supply line are usually class 200. Supply lines and conduits are usually class 315. Fittings and sleeves are usually Schedule 40. The most common way to join PVC pipe and fittings is by solvent welding. The contractor must follow the manufacturer's recommendations. However, the following procedure is the most predominant. The end of the pipe must be cut cleanly and straight. Pipe one and a half inches or less in diameter must be cut with a PVC cutter. Larger diameters can be cut by sawing. Wipe the ends of the pipe and fitting opening with a clean rag. Apply a primer to the pipe and fitting opening. The primer is a different color than the solvent, so its use can be identified. Apply an even coating of solvent to the pipe end first, and then the fitting opening. Slide the pipe and the fitting together. Make a quarter turn and hold together for at least 30 seconds. Wipe excess solvent from the joint. And make sure dirt doesn't contaminate the joint during assembly. When trenching for irrigation lines, trenches are to be dug a minimum of 1.2 meters or 4 feet from the adjacent curbs, dikes, and paved shoulders. The PVC pipe must be snaked when placed in trenches to allow for expansion and contraction. Supply lines that must cross paved ditches must be installed under those ditches that are less than nine-tenths of a meter or three feet deep. For paved ditches deeper than nine-tenths of a meter or three feet deep, galvanized steel pipe must be used to span the ditch. Finished trenches must be smooth and free of sharp objects that might puncture pipe or electrical conductors. Before trenches are backfilled, the water lines must be pressure tested for leaks. There are two pressure testing methods, method A and method B. Water lines that are visible can be tested by either method. Water lines that are not visible, such as irrigation crossovers, must be tested by method A. Both methods require that all water line ends and openings of the section to be tested be capped before testing. All testing is to be observed by the resident engineer or inspector. Method A requires the pipeline be filled with water and a pressure gauge with 0 to 200 PSI increments be attached. A pressure of 125 PSI is to be applied by air or water and held for one hour showing no more than 5 PSI pressure loss. Failure to pass the test requires locating and repairing leaks and repeating the test for as many times as necessary. In method B, water lines on the supply side and the discharge side of control valves have different test requirements. Supply side water lines are to be filled with and maintained at the water source's maximum pressure for eight hours. The same procedure applies to the discharge side water lines, except maximum pressure is to be held only for one hour. During and at the end of these periods, the water lines are to be visually observed for leaks. All failures are to be repaired 
and the test repeated for as many times as necessary. To hold water lines in place, partial backfill is usually allowed as long as all fittings are left uncovered. Conductors are direct burial, underground feeder type, low voltage conductors with polyvinyl chloride insulation. If rodent damage is expected to be a problem, armor clad conductors can be used or the conductors can be installed in conduit. Electrical conductors that connect valves to the controller are usually placed in the same trench as the main supply line and shall be adjacent to or below the pipe. Any trench needed for conductor routing without pipe must be a minimum of 12 inches deep. When conductors are surface mounted, such as on bridge structures or installed in concrete, they must be placed in rigid electrical conduit. Conductors are installed in non-metallic electrical conduit when they are required to be placed in water line or sprinkler control crossovers and in conduit under paved areas. Control conductors are to be color coded. For example, valve A1 blue, valve A2 yellow, and so on. Neutral conductors are to be white. Before final placement in the trench, all direct burial conductors are taped together at five foot intervals with electrical tape. At all valve and pull box locations, enough excess conductor wire must be left so that two feet of slack remains after hookup is completed. This is critical at the ends of bridge conduits and irrigation crossovers. Pull boxes are placed throughout the entire electrical system to make splices and provide testing locations for maintenance and repair. At a minimum, they should be located at crossover ends within five feet of controllers and every 500 feet along valve conductor runs. All conductor splices must take place in a pull box or valve box and must be waterproof. No splicing shall occur in open ground. Pull boxes are to be number five size or as shown on plans, set on half inch mesh, 19 gauge, galvanized woven wire, commonly called hardware cloth, over six inches of one half inch to three quarter inch crushed rock. The hardware cloth is placed between the rock and the bottom of the pull box to prevent gophers from filling up the box with their diggings. In the open ground, boxes are to be buried so their tops are two inches above surrounding grade. If the box is located in a paved area, the top is to be flush with finished grade. Box lids for low voltage valve conductors must be permanently marked sprinkler controls. Remote control valves are energized by low voltage power from the controller to either open the valves, which allows water to the lateral supply lines and sprinklers, or to close the valves. They contain a flow control stem on top of the valve, which can be used to manually shut off water. They also contain an internal or atmospheric bleeder valve, which can manually open the valve. Valve boxes should be installed after the pressure and conductor tests are completed and trenches are backfilled. As with pull boxes, valve boxes are to be set on galvanized woven wire over crushed rock. In the open ground, valve box tops are to be set two inches above surrounding grade. In paved areas, the top is to be flush with the paving. Make sure that specified valve assembly clearances inside the box are met. Each valve box lid must be permanently labeled with the controller letter and valve number as shown on the irrigation plans. The types of sprinklers used on highway planting and irrigation projects include impact sprinklers, rotary sprinklers, shrub sprays, bubblers, and mini spray sprinklers. Impact sprinklers can be mounted on threaded galvanized steel pipe risers or housed in plastic or cast iron housing for underground pop-up operation. Above grade risers are connected to the supply system via a swivel system made up of elbows and nipples. This allows the riser to be set perpendicular to the surrounding grade. 
Underground pop-up sprinklers require a concrete collar for protection when located in traffic or pedestrian areas. Risers are sometimes given extra support by strapping them to a pipe or rebar driven 12 to 18 inches into the ground. Impact sprinklers can be adjusted for full or part circle operation. Gear-driven rotary sprinklers have an internal hydraulic motor to drive sprinkler rotation. They can be mounted on risers or installed underground for pop-up operation. Their water patterns are adjustable. Because they do not create operational forces on the risers, additional riser support is not required. The majority of rotor sprinkler construction is plastic. Shrub sprays are used in narrow locations where impact or rotary sprinklers would overthrow the area. They come in many fixed patterns that can be selected to fit the area of coverage. They are mounted on risers and heights as required by contract specifications. Bubblers can be mounted on risers or on flexible hose on the surface of the ground. They apply water within the plant basin. Mini spray sprinklers apply water at very low rates of flow to the root zone or basin of the plant. A breakaway coupling is usually installed on sprinkler risers located near the roadway. Irrigation crossovers are usually installed with the roadway project. The conduit is usually corrugated steel pipe or corrugated high density polyethylene pipe. They contain a water line and the sprinkler control crossover installed with a pull wire. The water line and sprinkler control conduit terminate in a pull box on either end of the crossover. Thrust blocks are to be installed at the 90 degree bends in the water line. A pavement marker is to be glued to the edge of the freeway paving marking the location of the crossover. When crossovers are installed as part of a highway construction or bridge project, they must be pressure tested as part of that project. These should be located early in the highway planting project. Conductors are tested after backfilling the trench and prior to the functional test. This is commonly called the Megger test. In the presence of the resident engineer or inspector, the contractor will test all circuits for continuity ground and insulation resistance. The installation resistance test shall be at 500 volts direct current and the resistance shall not be less than 10 mega ohms on all circuits. If any of these tests result in a failure, the problem must be corrected and the test repeated. A functional test shall be done on the completed irrigation system. This consists of the contractor turning on each valve from the controller in the presence of the inspector. The inspector is to ensure that all parts of the irrigation system work as specified and that there is adequate sprinkler coverage. This test needs to be satisfactorily completed prior to the start of planting work. If there is a computerized remote irrigation control system, a second step of this test is to turn on each valve from the central controller while the inspector ensures the system works properly in the field. This test needs to be completed prior to the plant establishment period. This completes this overview of irrigation inspection. Remember, this was just the basics. Detailed information is found in the standard specifications and the special provisions for each project. Be sure to review your resident engineer package provided by the landscape architect and call him or her if you have any questions. And remember, the only dumb question is the unasked one.